Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are in the world. My name is Chris Paniotto. I am the developmental director of Rush Soccer, which is in 43 states and 50 countries, 50,000 players around the world. Our core value this month is respect. And uh, I am so happy to have Dave Clark join us. Clark, you welcome. Uh, thank you. Lovely to be here. Yeah, so a, a little story uh, real quick. So um, I used to get the soccer coaching weekly from this gentleman called Dave Clark that you see in front of us here with a, with a you know, manicured man, hair done, everything. And I'm like, man, this guy is brilliant. And then a couple of years ago, I, I saw him walking around in an England tracksuit at the convention, but I wasn't kind of brave enough to go over and say hello and thank you for your influence on my, on my work. Um, I wrote a little plan for a year long plan, 11s and 12s, um, about 10 years ago, and Dave's work featured in that. So, um, Dave, we're thrilled to have you. Welcome. And again, thanks for joining us. And uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. Okay, yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I was really pleased to hear that you'd, uh, that I had been some influence on the early part of your uh, coaching journey. So, uh, that, that, that's that's great. You know, um, my, my own coaching journey started really uh, with my two young sons who, um, when I took them to uh, coaching, um, I found it very, very difficult to stand on the sidelines and watch these coaches uh, with, you, you know, the coaches had, they have a great big bag of balls and they, they get one out. And uh, when your children are five, six, uh, six years old, the last thing they want to do is stand around and wait for the ball to come to them. And also, we, I, I studied a lot of uh, Dutch football. I studied this thing called Dutch vision when I first uh, started. So I, I went along to these uh, coaches um, in, in, in England near where I lived. And I thought, you know, here we would Dutch vision, be all individual skills. We'll start with a ball each. And it was nothing like that. You know, it was just here's a ball. Uh, sort yourselves into two teams. My, they're six years old. I was thinking, well, you know, by the time they're going to be 10 or 11, then they're not going to have learned anything. So that's kind of how I, I started. I, I got hold of a friend and said, look, we could do way better than this. Um, and so with my eldest son, uh, I, I started Dutch Vision with him and, and with his team. And um, and, and they got really good response from, uh, from uh, the, the parents. And from the other kids, you know, they really enjoyed it. Um, and, and I developed that. And then about three or four years later, with my, my second son, I obviously had all the uh, set up and it was all ready to go with him. Uh, and so I, worked, I, had to, I ran two teams. And that's when I really started to get into the idea of uh, being a coach, uh, what it involved, you know, know knowing myself, uh, knowing the players, and knowing what it was that I wanted them to do. And, and a lot of the time in the early stages, what I want them to do is just to enjoy the game. Um, and so we, I built up um, my reputation through that, um, which introduced me into um, um, a guy who was looking to uh, put out uh, material to coaches to help them. So um, I went along and started doing that. And then eventually um, it developed into Soccer Coach Weekly. Uh, so, you know, and, and I, I do that every week, send out information for from, un, from under sixes, right, to so under 18s. So, Soccer Coach Weekly, right? Tell me yeah. how many people this is hitting, how many people are subscribing, and, you know, it's from under six to under 18, you said? Yeah. So, we have, we well, I probably con goes out to uh, probably 500,000 coaches every week. So... Uh, you know, they, they don't all subscribe. A lot of them uh, just want uh, general uh, information from me, which they'll get for free with a, a free session that they can use that week. And, and other coaches obviously um, want to develop themselves and want to learn uh, rather than just on a Thursday night, they've got an hour to get through and that's what they want to do. So they'll take a session from me and say, can I use this session without actually coaching? I'll say, yeah, I said it, or this is how you set it up. These are what will happen when you play the game because it'll have various things that bring out the coaching point rather than a coach having to stand there and do it. So 
Um, if you are, you know, if, if that's basically uh, you know, a lot of dads just want to be able to do that with their son's team. It makes, you know, it means that they look quite good and the boys are being developed not by um, not by themselves, but it looks like they're being developed by themselves. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, uh, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, obviously different different markets, right? So for for example, yeah. I'm sure in England, you know. Uh, for those that don't know, football is like a religion, right? Yeah. Um, and everybody's got their views. Uh, and over here, people are going to discuss that, you know, what we call the Monday morning quarterbacks. Um, this is what they should have done. This is what the coach could have done. Da, 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 da. Um, so in essence, it's giving, it's, it's giving coaches who may not have the experience, but have the desire, the tools to be able to deliver a good session. Yeah? yeah, would that be fair? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Because what what happens is, like you say, um, someone will say, I, "I need someone to run a team," and the the dads will think, "Well, my son's in the team. I go to watch Chelsea every week. What you know? What is a what, what's an hour with a bunch of six year olds going to be to me when I when I watch uh, you know when I watch the best players in the world? Uh, how is it going to be a problem? And then when it, after three weeks of them. <laughs> tearing their hair up because it's not easy you know whatever age you coach you know, coaching isn't it's not a simple case of just turning up and doing it um and, and and so then they will turn to me and say uh well basically what do i do because it you know the, yeah. the kids don't want to line up and, and shoot a goal every week I mean. yeah no yeah absolutely so with the with the uh well talk a little dave about your your coaching uh licensure and experience too if you if you don't mind because i know you have your ua for b and i know you've gone through the, your youth modules through the fa of one two three you've even got yeah. the catalan football federation smart football level one and you've got dutch you've got the corva stuff talk, talk a little yeah. about um you know what you noticed on those courses um and, and we'll we'll d delve into that a little bit more and then we'll come back to what you said because you said something really poignant earlier which we'll come back to. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, I'll, if I start with, I did uh, smart football, which is basically Spanish uh, football with the, the Catalonian uh, Federation. Um, and I did, I've done level one and it's a, a totally different way really of coaching um, than I would have learned on my FA style coaching. So when did you do the Catalan one, Dave? Right, Just so we can uh, put it. Two summers ago, I started to, to working on it, um, yeah. and 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 the, so the, the I worked with with uh, Leatherhead uh, Football Club, and the Spanish coaches came over, um, and there was about six or seven of us on that course, and they teach you. It's basically smart football is possession based football, so and you're doing all these little games to to keep possession, but it, it and it's always opposed; it's never unopposed, um, but. What the, the one of the key things is the questioning of the of, of the children play afterwards. So you question your players. Uh, say you wanted them to pass the ball down the wing, but they were every single time they were passing it through the middle. Um, so you would say, and, and they're losing the ball. So your question would wouldn't be why did you keep losing the ball? It would be what could you have done differently? And and with, with the with I would more or less in the old days have said. If I passed the ball down the wing, would that have made would that have made it easier? And the kids would say, pick up on that straight away and say, yes, it would. Yeah, that would have been. And so I say, well, there you go. There's your coaching point. Now, you don't mention playing down the wing. You talk about when we were going through the middle, what problems did we have? How do we solve those problems? And then eventually, they will come up with the answer themselves. And because they've come up with the answer themselves. It's more likely that you know it goes in here and they'll learn it without me saying thinking to myself oh we've been we've been on this point now for you know 40 seconds and they've not said anything and i'm beginning to worry that the parents are looking at me and i've got all this pressure on me and shall i just tell them so you know just let, let them sort it let them work it out and, and and they also learn how to um it helps them solve problems as well because they um the way that you're talking to them they suddenly pick up and they think right Dave's not talking about the centre of he's talking about the centre of the pitch. He's not mentioning the other areas, so that must be the key to what we're doing. So I think I think I learn and they learn uh, 
from that process. And I went through my um, FA coaching badges. It takes quite a while by the time you've got, you get to your A for B. Um, and it is quite, it's, there's a lot, lot of work involved. Uh, but you do, you know, I met some great people on those courses and it does give you, gives you a, a bit of an insight into how coaching developed in, in England and also the differences between the coaches from, from, from the rest of the world to, to how you're, you're taught. And, and when I did my first set of uh, coaching, it was very much a stop start kind of coaching, which, you know, it freeze. Stop, stand still. That's the one. Yeah. And then you've got to remember what, and you put all the players back into the situation they were in. I, I never really liked that because I used to think to myself, and because, you know, little Johnny would say, I wasn't standing there, Dave. And he'd say, well, you were nearly there, weren't you? He'd say, I wasn't anywhere near there. I was over there. And he'd say, well, was he over there? And so I, I've never really liked that. So I, I, I do like it now that it's changed and they do a lot more. They've got rid of the kind of stop start and thing. Yeah. So I, I, I went up and did my UA for B. And then I, I, I have thought about, um, you know, obviously with UA for B, I can coach uh, children at every age group and, and, and uh, help coach uh, with the adults as well. So um, I have thought about my UA, UA for A, but um, that's a lot of work as well. So um, Yeah. It's, uh, it's not cheap either, and it takes a w quite a while, doesn't it? Not cheap, no. It's not cheap. And do, you, uh, do people have to be invited to the UA for A, or is it just open open uh, application? Well, you you, yeah, you apply. You can apply. So it's when you get higher that, you know, it's the um, the pro license when you get higher, and then yeah. you, you get invited to take that. So. Yeah, so I did my UA for B, Dave, in 2007, I think. I did it in 2007 in june 2000 no it was 2006 and i did it at lillishaw before we oh, went, right, yeah. england moved to st george's and uh i loved it uh i thought it was fantastic you know obviously you know the back then i think it was uh coach through a small-sided game which might have been 8v8 it might have been a functional practice or it might have been a phase of play um and now i think they introduced more wave training and, and stuff like that and i recently did my ussfb um which was really interesting because I did my USSFC years ago um, and had a terrible experience and did my UEFA B and the federations changed a little bit. But what they did is they used the, what, what they call the OLLI method. So it was orientation, learning, implementation. So just like you talk about with the Catalan stuff. So if we're doing playing out at the back, I would spend the first, you know, 10, 15 minutes orienting the opposing team to set the problem for the team trying to build out. So I would give them a responsibility like press high um, when the center back switches it to the center back. That's your moment. That's your trigger to press. How many goals can you score? And then I just say to the to the team I'm working with, the, the focus team, I would say, OK, uh, how quickly can you get out uh, and get into the midfield third? And then we'd let them struggle. So you'd set the table, let them struggle. And then you'd step in and go, okay, what were you noticing? What did you see? What did you do? And then you'd give them starting positions and you'd help them out a little bit. And then, you know, you're into the into the flex. But it was it was through the game per se, as opposed to through drills or activities and standing in lines, you know? So we're coaching the topic, it's playing out the back. The counter topic is pressing, you know? All right. It just goes yeah. hand in hand. Um, yeah. Is that what you found with the with the smart football stuff? Um, yeah, there, there is, yeah, there is a lot of that. You would be, uh, you would work on, on, on the two. So you would have to, you would, you would, the team you were coaching, you would basically have a list of things that you wanted to get out of that. But yeah, and then you would also have to list, uh, what the team that you weren't coaching. Uh, so they're, if they're the defending team, then what are you looking out for from them? Yeah. So you're so, trying yeah. to get this coaching point across, but it, uh, Yes, yeah. so it's, Co coach man coach one manage the other as they told us on our way for b years ago right yeah. yeah so brilliant so the thing i wanted to come back to dave which i thought was yes. brilliant obviously you said you got into coaching and you were coaching your two young sons you go to the to the session the coach has got a bag of ball he breaks out one ball right for five and six year olds um if you if you do recall what were the 
so they're five and six. What were the configuration? What were they playing? Was it 7v7, 8v8, 11v11? What was game day? What did that look like? Yeah, game day was probably, uh, it was probably maybe 5v5. Okay. Um, so they would be, and it was on, they were on quite, quite big pitches then. So yeah. they would be pretty, pretty, they'd be buzzing around. So they were pretty tired by the end, chasing one ball around, as you can imagine. And then, yeah whether they develop individual skills or not if the, if the ball went in the net the coach went absolutely berserk and uh no yeah, I could, as, one, as one as thing it does i do remember from that though is my my son used to he was he became my my eldest son was a good central defender my youngest yeah. son was a really good goal scorer i think it's probably because they were in the garden together but my youngest son when there was one coach who used to say he scored a lot of goals but with toe punts you know and, and um the coach kept saying to him that's not a goal because you scored it by using your toes rather than the top of the boot or the side and then i i pointed out ronaldinho to him and i said watch ronaldinho and or it might have been Ronaldo, one of them in in the world cup and he scored Ronaldo, 2002. That's he scored it, yeah. three goals three goals with the toe poke and finished with eight goals on the tournament yeah and so um i said to my son that you know you can't these, these are the things that our coaches are telling him and you know it's just total nonsense if you can toe poke it in well fantastic you know um yeah. but it was always you break your toes you won't do it and and then he was thrilled when he saw uh yeah he saw you know the, one of the best players in the world actually yeah. using his toe yeah and and i think it's 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 funny right so for the coaches listening i think we have you know we have habits sometimes as coaches and we say don't do this don't do that um really there's no absolutes, right? So if we're coaching and we want players to pass and we always want them to use the inside of their foot, heel down, toe up, ankle locked, push pass, um, maybe Modric wouldn't be the player he is right now using the outside of his foot. And maybe R9, original Ronaldo, doesn't finish with that golden boot. I think it's important that we get in and we show them the right technique. However, if it's working for them, Right, and we've taught them the right technique. What? Why? Why change it? I think the Cruyff turn was was uh, created by Johan in a mistake. Right, it just like cleaning up and it's something he yeah. did. So, he yeah. So here's the the things that I thought were really poignant as well, Dave. Was number one, you said I wanted to know myself. Number two, yeah. I had to know the players, and number three, I wanted to know. I, I had to know what I wanted them to know, right? Yeah. And I just think that is so profound because sometimes we don't know who we are as coaches. And what I'll say by that is, is we may say, you and I, Dave, we're player-centered and we're player-led, but we're the one barking instructions and solving all the problems. We're asking a question and we, hey, if we play high pressure here, what does that mean we can do? Well, we can win the ball back high, right? And we're giving the answers as well, right? We're not giving the kids the answers. Yeah. So knowing who we are, which I think comes from a lot of reflection, right? Um, and watching ourselves on video and watching back um, and thinking or, or micing ourselves up gives us that who are we and who do we want to be as a coach. Knowing who's in front of us, I think is huge, especially in this day and age right now with what the world's going through. Yeah. Right. So you hear, a couple of the things I'm noticing, Clarky, are, you know, kids are getting to training because kids are doing online school here. So kids yeah. are getting to training. Um, we've got physical distancing measures, but kids want to spend the first five or 10 minutes catching up and actually having that connection. Right. In real life time. As opposed yeah. to through the screen like you and I are doing right now. You know, yeah. so I think as coaches, we have to be understanding. This is this is what they need right now. Yes, it's taking five to seven minutes away from our training session. However, we're probably taking 10 minutes away because we're making inappropriate interventions that last for four and a half minutes. Yeah, <laughs> right? You know, but I think knowing who's in front of you and knowing what they need, I think is huge right what insights and what advice can you give the coaches on and people who will watch this later on just getting to know those people a little bit better um who's in front of them 
Yeah, well, I, I will start by saying um, one, one, of the one of the things that, that's happened, especially at the moment, is that playing out, um, playing out had probably died out in the 1980s, didn't it, when computers began to take over. So playing out was a thing that um, my sons would have maybe done and the kids down the street maybe would have done. So they'd have all played, you know, I used to play play out and I, I learned a lot and um, I learned a lot about relationships and about a lot about um, playing the game and you know the, the older kids used to say right you can be in defense because you're only you're seven and I'm nine I'm gonna play up front and and then as you got older you went through the midfield into uh, into the up front into the you know the best positions as they as they like to think of them so um so that that's a key thing they're not playing out. So when they turn up at training, um, what I always do is uh, they, they'll come in and I want them to talk to me. So I want, I'll want to give them a, go up to them. And I, I need to, you know, I basically, I need to know what they are, whether they're brothers and sisters. So I can walk up to them and say, hey, you know, I hear your brother's not well, how's he? Or I hear you were on holiday last week, how did it go? Just talk to each individual one. Um, and and that, that, that's, a, that's a huge um, way because they will then pour out and they'll give you way more information than you're ever going to give them. So they'll tell you, I mean, what, one of the boys I was coaching on Tuesday night and, and every time he turns up, he's, he's a, a, for the under 10s. And the minute he's, what, he's coming through the gate and he's about 100 yards away and I can see he's already talking to me. Um, and <laughs> by the time he gets to me, I hear the last word and I say to him, Say to him, you know, you can't, I think you can't, you have to wait till you get to me. I know you're keen to tell me what you've been up to because that's what we do. So, uh, and then, and then they, they enjoy that. But one of the other key things is that they haven't played out, you know, and the coach that says, whoa, you know, what are you doing? You're all messing around. Yeah, they are going to mess around. So I give everyone a ball. The mark, there's a marked out square, you know, whatever area you want it to be. And, and for the first five to 10 minutes, then I get them to do individual skills. We'll go around and say, all right, keepy uppies, how many time, how many keepy uppies can you do? And you get the ones who say, I can't do them at all. So we'll say, okay, well, you do one then, you come back to me and tell me when you've done one. And you don't, you don't have to be watching, they're, they're, they're actually learning an individual skill because they, they're using the ball themselves. Um, they can still chat to each other, but they're doing the ball themselves and you don't have to actually watch what they're doing at that phase. You don't have to be totally, you can actually talk to one of them or, or you can set up the next phase because they're, they're, they're doing and that helps you A, get to know them and B, helps them understand that your training session isn't a, you know, it isn't, you're not in the army, you're not going and you're not all standing in a line and waiting for Dave to tell them, right, now you can do this. We're going to get in, we're going to play over the ball and you're going to show me, yeah, I can do this thing. I've done four, I've done four, great. Or watch, I can do a stop turn. I, can, I couldn't do it last week, but I can do it this week. So, um, and, and in that way, they, um, not only are you, are you getting to know them, but they're thinking about you and they're, they're wanting to, um, you know, to almost impress you with the fact that, yeah, they can do this with the skills. And, and, they're, and, and they're playing, you know, they're actually playing, um, out they're doing what they may have done in the garden on their own or with their mates um and so i think that's really key uh, to, to any coaching session so yeah i think that's massive so um a couple a couple of weeks ago we had a gentleman called uh, dr jean cote um who talks about transformational coaching um and you hit some of the things right there obviously he's giving the kids an environment where they can try things um and I think, I think in rugby terms, they call it chunking. So you've given a kid, hey, go away. Here's your first five minutes. Go work on a skill that you want to improve. So now they're um, more self-aware, right? I might look at Clarkie doing around the world and going, I can't do that. Hey, Clarkie, can you help me a little bit? So now that player might be able to help the other player. But I think it's brilliant because you've got arrival activities. They can work on something. And if they choose to mess about, that's okay because they're yeah. what nine and ten years old like you said um i think that's huge um so what we've done here in the us the grassroots stuff is they do a lot of play practice play clarky so basically kids start showing up 
and we just get them into small sided games. And then yeah. uh, there's observation. So we might be looking at uh, creating goal scoring opportunities. So you might start to plant the seeds and observe them. And then we'll go into the practice phase where there might be a less challenging and a more challenging activity. And then we'll go back into the game, slightly bigger numbers. So quite similar to whole part whole, although yeah. it's just broken down. Um, well, what we found with that is the engagement levels, um, kids would start putting pressure on their parents to get them at training quicker because they knew they started with the game. And if, if you think back to our experiences, Dave, um, it was probably a lot of fitness at the beginning where you'd be like, your mum would be like, hey, it's time to go to training. Go, oh no, we start at 6.15, not 6. So you miss the fitness. Um, and then the coach would probably say, if you behave, I'll let you play at the end. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and that probably still goes on. Kids waiting in, in lines like we did at school for PE as well. Um, you know, and if you're 38 in the class, if you're number 37 in line, number 36 hates you because you're flicking their ears, right? Um, yeah. Or pulling on their shorts. But it's it's finding ways to, to get kids active, engaged, and especially with the, with the statistics we look at. So apparently 75% uh, of teenagers drop out of sport in the US, right? Um, and a, a scary statistic, Dave, and I think we talked about this on your podcast, was yeah. uh, children, prison inmates get more outside time than children do in the US and in England, right? So we've got to make our time meaningful and, you know, leave them wanting more and, and like wanting to come back and excited, you know? So, you know, tell us, tell us about your favorite practice, right? Um, and then this is a two-parter. Tell us about your favorite practice and why it was your favorite practice. And then tell us about a session that you might have spent a long time on and then just ended up ripping it up because it was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> can you do that, Dave? Do you mind sharing that? No, no, no I can, uh, I can, I can do that. Can I just, what I will pick up on, and one thing that you were saying, which I think is really important, is that people, pe coaches do say you're not going to play the game at the end because you've been messing about. And, yeah. and, and what I always say is, well, that is the whole point of why you are doing this. It's not yeah they do love playing it but it's key the whole the game is the key that's what we're funneling everything into is the game so give them something else to do but please don't tell them they can't play the game because you, 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 you're, it's yourself that really you're, you're, you're hurting by not allowing them to play the game well you're hurting but, the kids and, too right but just to, just to add on to what you said right if we think about why they're messing about well, is your session design sloppy? Was your transition from one to another too long? Was your intervention too long? Was it delivered above their heads? You know, were we chasing five different things we're trying to do? So therefore we couldn't get anything because we chased five rabbits and they all got away, right? So I think it's key there too. If they're messing around, well, maybe it's not age appropriate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, no. That's that's um, absolutely um, so. Yeah. So when I when I build up with my sessions, I will do. I will probably start. Um, I I will do a little unopposed game, which I I use. Which it's um, I tell. I I can't remember whether it is or not, but I always tell the kids that I le I learned this at Barcelona. It's how they uh, it's how they do their their training sessions. So you would have three three cones, player in the middle and one player either side, so whatever distances you, you want really. Um, the first player plays it. Now what the player in the middle has to do, and it's really key, is as the player plays him, he's running round. So the player receives the ball, he's got to turn. And, and I find with the, the youngsters, that's the hardest thing, turn, and he's got to pass it into his running. So he's running, and so you've got to turn and put, play the ball. Now it can be, a, they can get really lazy with that, because you can just, you can tap it and, you know, the ball come into you, just tap it, and it'll probably go in the general direction of where the player's running. But for what I what I explain to them is right, you know, you're ready, bouncing, bouncing, get ready, bang, and it comes, turn, Ooh. turn, pass, and then you run, and then you run forward, and he'll turn, and you receive the ball. So you've got three players, turn, pass to the one, 
So you're basically doing short pass, short pass, then long pass. Um, and all of the players are moving into position. So immediately you get into that central position, the ball's coming straight to you. Um, and and, if, and if, if we can, what I try to do at, at all age groups is get them working on this and eventually we'll do it. And then I'll say, right, let's speed it up, move the cones in slightly. Now you're in the penalty area. Now you're gonna hit, hit this ball fast. So the ball's gonna come in, one pass, two, you're gonna move there, receive, one pass, two. And so with your one, your, it's basically one, two, three, but it, it does, it develops your ability to know that you, A, that you've got to pass the ball into the run of your teammate because he doesn't want it behind him because immediately, you know, if it's not into his run, uh, how is he, how is he going to shoot a goal or how is he going to, you know, beat the defender? So it's a simple game, but you're teaching a, a lot of different things in it. And then with the long pass and receive, you've got to receive, uh, and so you, you can control and receive. And also I'll say to them, you pack, we're going to do this one touch, but look where you pass the ball. You passed it across his body. Now he's left footed. You know he's left footed because you play with him every single week and you pass it onto his right foot. How is he going to shoot? How is he going to pass if it's on his right foot? And he'll say, well, I'm good on my right foot. I'll say, well, that's fine. But if, if we're under pressure or we're in the penalty area, you're looking at you're looking at the player you know that you know that uh, he's going to be so you you'll put you'll play the pass onto his left foot and he can one touch it so we go for one touch and obviously one touch never lasts particularly long because you know one of them all <laughs> it just gets faster and faster until they all until they all um you know lose the ball but and um, i really do i like that little session it's simple, it's unopposed. And then, and then I will move into, say, an opposed session where it will be a square and you have four players on the sides of the square, one player on each side and a player in the middle. Um, and I really like that game because A, you could make it as a, the square as big or as small as you want to make it really difficult. But then you can add in, you can add in a, a, a magic man in the, in the middle who, who plays for the four on the outside, add two more, two defenders in there or play a 2v2 in the centre. So um, I, I would build up my session like that and then um, take it into a game. Um, but uh, I, I know we're going to talk about Marcello Bielsa <laughs> at some stage, but what Marcello Bielsa does is something called murder ball. So um, he plays this with, with Leeds United uh, in training and he does it for about 10, 15 minutes, depending. And so what happens is all the players have to move all the time. So they have to be moving all the time. Uh, and then he has all his coaches standing around the area. So immediately the ball goes out, another one comes in. So you're always running. So I, I kind of changed this for my own sense so that we play this. So I, I have a load of balls next to me. And I, every time the ball goes out, I roll one in. But I say to them, if they stop moving, it's 20 seconds on the sidelines. And so they'll be playing this game and they will, they all, they'll all stop and then they'll think, oh no, and it'll be out for 20 seconds and, and I'll get them to count themselves. So some of them are going, what do you do, what is going and, and it's so, they, they have a really lot of fun, but within that, their technique is massively challenged because it is quite, they do feel quite pressured. I know, so I only do it, I'll say I'll probably do for seven or eight minutes because it, it does challenge them. And sometimes I can see some of them get, you know, or they're, they, they, the pre the, constantly running it gets them worked up and they but then, then we'll take that in, into a game so that yeah. would be um generally so with with the murder ball bielsa's yeah. murder ball there's two teams possessing and nobody's allowed to stop moving that's the the concept yeah. have two goals okay. okay so there's goals as well yeah you score the you the score the balls played straight into the to the opposition and they and then they're attacking so you've got to get back quickly so it's yeah. a it's a, it's a really, it's it's a really fast. What uh, what are the numbers? What are the numbers in that eight v eight? Maybe depending on your numbers. Depending on my numbers, we played um, four v four on Tuesday night. We played four v four with two goalies, so and that that worked. But then you just change the size of the area. Really. It's good to have quite a tight area, um, because then the two in and fro in. Um, but yeah, and that and um, that that really. But I will tell you uh, when you talk about a session not working. This, this, the reason this, <laughs> I felt really terrible at the time, because the reason this session didn't work, we, it was the FA, UA for B, and we, you know, you know on, on, on the courses, you have to, you have to be the kids for your, the other coaches. 
And so, you know, you, you always, I always you may try your hardest because it's so unfair for the coach if you don't. So we've been, we've done it a whole day and on the last session, it was crossing, it was crossing the ball in. So it was basically build up and cross the ball into a striker who would score. So he asked me if I would do the crossing, I run down the wing and cross the ball in. So, so and he's being assessed on this. So I run down the wing, my first cross, it goes, it didn't only go out of the park, it goes over the fence. So I'm crossing miles and it curls miles, it's like a golf shot, curl nowhere near the player in the middle, so we have to reset. So we reset, same thing happened again, and then we reset again. And at this point, he just turned to me and said, Dave, please, you know, uh, can, can someone else please cross the ball? <laughs> Doing that 10 minutes and not one ball has crossed. So, um, yeah, I felt really <laughs> But he could have, he could have really, he could have really coached you there. Do you know what I mean? That's coaching, Dave. I'm just gonna, my uh, power cord's dying. I'm just gonna flip up a switch. I'll be right, right. I'll be right back. Yeah, You'll yeah, be yeah. Sent yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no problem at all. It's, uh, it's always a problem, isn't it, when um, your power, when your power, when your power starts flashing and you know that it's um, gonna run out. But got yeah. it. Sorry about that. But I do, um, I do. It's always good to come up with new, new ideas and new sessions. And I, I, I have um, when we were when we were working on sessions for um, return to play, where we had you know groups of five. Yeah. I, I, I worked on this really intricate passing session with two footballs, five players, and and how they would pass and move. And after ten minutes, I just, I just didn't work. It just didn't work at all. So I said to them, I'll oh, scrap this, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do something else. And they were going, no, no, we want it to work. <laughs> I said, I've worked it out wrongly with the wrong number of players and the wrong number of balls. But that's, there should have been, a, every time the ball went back to one of the servers, there should have been a spare man here. But the same spare man kept appearing and I, I couldn't work out. So I, yeah. you know. We, I, had, uh, I, had a, I had a little session the other day where um, it was, uh, I had, two groups but it was real quick moving and it was serve the ball get over a guy win the defensive header land as soon as the defender landed another attacker attacked and then the other side would go but they couldn't coordinate the times of going so there was two going and the goalkeeper had to try and save two so i'm like guys okay let's just do it this way let's just do it with one and just go 2v2 instead of the 1v1 and the kids got it right away um yeah. i was coaching a group of four-year-olds one year and uh we were playing a game called bring back so the kids come up to you you know pre-covid they can hand you the ball with both hands you throw it away and you tell them how to bring it back well we're in this gym little boy jack now he was three or four at the time jack's 22 now and he's at the um air force academy in colorado springs and i just saw him last summer right he comes over uh he gives me the ball I throw the ball away. I say, Jack, bring the ball back using your imagination, right? Meanwhile, I've got three rounds. I've done it, thrown it away. I turn around and I'm like, Jack's right behind me on my left hip. And he's going like this. And I'm like, Jack, what are you doing? He says, coach, I'm using my, my imagination, but the ball still won't come back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so obviously, we, you know, we, we've got to be um, very... The use of language, right? The use of language is, is important and yeah. what we tell them, how our information goes, basically. So, Clarky, with, with some of the sessions you're talking about, I think what we'll do is if you email me a couple, I'll put it in the show notes so then people can, can grab it and yeah, have a look absolutely. at the, the sessions you're talking about. Um, so, I'm still stuck on the half a million, right? Half a million coaches and the, the information you get out there um that's a high number dave man thank you you know yeah thank you for for all you do there and and stuff and you know how can how can people listening to this who aren't familiar with your work in the soccer coaching weekly um and i know you you're an actually you're a consultant with elite soccer as well right which is part that's of the right. lma and and stuff yeah. like that how can how can people get more uh into your work what can they do and you know you have a web address that you can share or you know, for the coaches that are on this, thank you for being on, obviously, and trying to, to spend, you know, 
60 minutes with us and, and take away some things that will help you in your coaching journey, you know? Yeah, no, they can, um, well, soccercoachweekly.net is the, uh, is, so it's all one word, soccercoachweekly.net is our website. And um, the elite, elite soccer coaching, um, a consultant coach with her, we get the, the sessions are all from, um, you know, the Premier League coaches and coaches from League One and League Two. <clears throat> so Soccer Coach Weekly is mainly um, youth coaching. Yeah. Um, so it'll, it'll all be grassroots stuff. Well, the other's more, Elite Soccer's more academy um, based. So yeah, they can do yeah. that. Or, or if anyone has any, uh, you know, questions or, or, or want to get, they can um, email me uh, directly. Um, and, and, and I can give my email address out. Yeah, I have no yeah. problem. So it's um, it's David two number two, David two Clark with an E, and that's at live.co.uk. If anyone has any questions that they yeah. want answering. Brilliant. And then let's uh, let's let's get onto your beloved Leeds. Let's talk <laughs> about uh, Bielsa and his murder ball and uh, the impact that he's had on Leeds, but also had on well, will have on the Premier League. Um, because they went to Anfield last week and uh, did not give a bad account of themselves. Oh yeah, no, they played. They were they were, they were absolutely brilliant. I, I must say, I've been not panicking, but I've been kind of you know you, you look at Liverpool and you just think to yourself, wow, you know how how on earth do you control that that front three of Liverpool and and you know how do you get through that back four? So and 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 midfield. So I, I was thinking to myself, you know, let, let's keep let's hope we can keep this. The score down. I don't want to come away with a four nil or a, a five nil at worst. You know, you're thinking, oh my goodness, I mean, what would it be? But then, you know, wow. Um, we played basically when we were in um, the league below. <coughs> Marcello Bielsa has taken players, and um, you know, everyone says about the influence of a coach. Um, well, the players, the similar players of previous season had been mid-table mediocrity players that you thought, oh, you know, are these guys gonna ever going to make it and 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 some of them had been sent out on loan and, and Bielsa brought them all back brought them together and, and after you know a summer of coaching them they were these super speedy fit clever football I mean we play it's clever football it's not um you know it's not whack it up whack it up to the big guy up front I mean it's it's play, play it to your keeper, play little triangles with the keeper while the opposition run around and then, you know, knocking it into midfield and then spreading it wide, switching play. I mean, any, any, any form of attack you like, you can think of, then leads to it. And it, you know, I said to my, uh, to, to my eldest son the other day, I, I, we were watching a, a game and I said, we've been spoiled by Marcello Bielsa because of every single match we watched since Marcello Bielsa has come to league. It's been astonishing, you know, it's just exciting the whole time we played this very fast game. Um, so, so I think, you know, he, he is a classic uh, a case of someone who will develop the individual beyond that. So he brings them up and brings the very best out of them that, that he can get. And, and, you know, that's what I see all coaches, you know, the individual winning one v ones and 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 taking that into a two v one, or but but being able to beat the player that's in front of you at any age, you know, is what Marcello Bielsa gives them, and I I think that it's a it's a wonderful a wonderful way to coach, and a, a you know, and and a, and a fantastic um way to deliver it for for the watching uh, public. So yeah, you I've. Uh, You've been to them. watch him a few times, right? Training. Yeah, yeah. So, what yeah. are the things that you've seen apart from murder ball when when you're there? Well, he will he will work on um, so he'll work on individual one v one skills. So he'll play balls into the strikers, and he'll get the strikers will shoot from you know all all sorts of distances. Or, you know, he'll cr cross balls in, so it'll be like he'll hit them on the so they'll they'll. You, 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 you cross a ball in at speed and, and they'll hit it on the volley. Well, of course, the first time you hit, you come across it, you probably miss the ball because someone, if, when you know when the ball's coming across, you're like that, timing and everything. It's difficult, even when it's on the floor, to get your foot in the right positions and not. As you know, Sterling saw the other night when he spooned it over the bar for Manchester City. You, it, it's, 
and, and, and that's the individual things he puts on players and the, the ability to hold on to the ball when you've got five or six players around you. And, and then he'll give them that ability, whereas before they, they would lose it. And someone like Patrick Bamford can hold play up for ages just by holding on to the ball. And, and then, you know, the rest of the team will catch him up. Although with Leeds, we've seen against Liverpool, we, we, we have five players in their half of the pitch when we were playing out from the back. I mean, that's to me, that's incredible and, and quite yeah. scary because their midfield didn't know what to do, really. They didn't know whether to drop back, but then the defenders were there. Do they drop forward? Well, there's no one there to drop into. So, yeah. It's, um... Posing new questions, right? Yeah. Football of the yeah. future. Exciting. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny because I have some little ones um, and, you know, we try and keep the ball. We're possession based, right? Um, but possession for progression, we want to go forward. We want to score goals. And I'm OK with the with the kids. You know, you, you'll hear some coaches never across the middle. Well, why not? There's nobody there. Well, there's somebody close by. Yeah, but it's OK. You know, yeah. the other day I, we were playing a, a local local neighbors and keeper comes out he's caught high takes a player on goes to make a pass loses it to the next player kid wins it shoots scores in the net empty net a bit later on keeper dives it goes under his body and he's looking at me and i'm just looking at him and i didn't say anything and after the game i'm like big man you're all right and this is nine or ten he's like yeah coach you know i made a mistake i'm like well are you a pro keeper? He's like, no. I said, so you don't get paid to play? He's like, no. I said, oh, well, don't worry about it, man. Move on. Yeah. Go get your ice cream, you know. Um, but he's like, okay, you know. But it was, you know, it, it's just when, when you think about those things, right, which, which brings us right, well, it, it's, it is a game and it should be fun. It should be around the people it's about and not the coach per se. Um, yeah. So it's huge so as we get to finish up here clarky what what advice would you give to people that are on this listening later about session design planning um and, and stuff like that well the, the biggest advice i can give you is that um with your sessions you, you need to under you as a coach need to understand the focus of the session and what what you want to get out of the session but also you need to be able to explain that to your players so your players will get that out of the session and you'll get it out so if you're if you're if you're designing a, a session where you're playing through the middle and when every time the ball comes into the player in the middle you want him to spread it out wide because he's gonna you know basically he's just got to believe that his players will be running down the wing because you know they'll turn they can scan and they can see but when you're young and the ball comes into you sometimes it's difficult but if you make that decision, okay, I'll play it out wide. So you need to make it realistic for them as well. That don't, you know, and, and if, if, if you're designing that session, think about the mistakes that, that will be made because you, kids will learn, learn massively from making a mistake. And so if they do it and the mistake's no, no, and you stop it and then no, 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 they'll think, oh, I'm not going to do that again. But if you let them play through and they make a mistake, they'll think, next time I do that, I'm going to go to the left rather than go into the right where the player is. And they'll think it themselves. Or you can say to them, maybe, maybe we should have gone left there rather than right. So think yeah. about the mistakes that players will make in your sessions, and then you will be able to develop. I think, I think you, you develop a lot sessions a lot easier if you can think about the mistakes. And also think about um, the coaching point should be fairly Fairly, depending on the age, fairly easy for them to understand. And, and as long as you understand it and you can, if, if you can't explain it to them, then the session's too, too difficult. Too difficult, yeah. But just to build on that as well, not just thinking about the mistakes, thinking about the players in the session that might make the mistakes. Because I think we've all got in our groups, coach asks the question, kid raises the hand and it's the same kid, right? Answering yeah. the question. And sometimes they're just repeating the, the coach babble that we've given them. Yeah, you know what I mean, um, yeah, I think it's Limov, uh, Doug Limov, who uses what he calls cold calling. So, for example, I'll ask the question, Dave, you may answer the question, and I might say, Gary, I'm coming to you after Dave to build on Dave's answer. You know what I mean? So, we're cold calling them to make sure they're paying attention yeah. and, and stuff like that. Yeah. 
I think that's huge. I think that's huge. We're gonna we're gonna open up to questions, Clarky, if uh, if you're okay with that from our audience. Um, which again, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, if you do have questions, please type in. I know someone early on said they couldn't see Clarky or my camera. Um, uh, you're not missing much with me, but Clarky's hair looks immaculate <laughs> as usual. Um, so if you have questions, please type them in. If not, no worries. Um, and if you think of questions, you, obviously you've got my email. And uh, I'm Chris, by the way, not Sky Eddie, that it says. And uh, thanks to Sky for letting us use their forum. But you've got Clarky's email as well. And you can type in those questions uh, afterwards as well. But, oh, we do have a question that's come in, Clarky. Um, it says, okay, great question by Judith Sasso. Hopefully I didn't kill your name there, uh, Judith. He says, uh, how do you handle kids with severe ADHD? Do you want to have a stab at that one, Clarky? <laughs> yeah, that it's it it is tricky, isn't it? I mean, because they're gonna um, they 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 obviously take up up the whole of your time, and they will they will um, stop you spending time on other players because in in your mind you will know that this is this is a kid that any at any moment could ruin your your coaching session. Um, I think what what I often do in situations like that is I I, I will break them down into say I'll, I'll be saying okay in this session I know that you know little Johnny here he might get a little bit agitated so I'm going to break it up into groups of three we're all going to do the same thing but we're going to be working in groups of three and I know that in Johnny's group I might have two kids who can kind of handle that kind of thing but also I can Get the others set up and then i can actually go to johnny to just the three of them and say right let's we'll do this we'll do that um so so you, you do have to give them um a bit more time and it does take a bit more um concentration from you on how you coach them but but by splitting them into di different groups you, the other groups aren't affected at all and you can far more uh, affect how that behavior if he's in a small group um I, it's it's not easy basically yeah. Yeah, I think you, you you got you hit some main ones there like differentiation, right? By task or outcome, you know, can can we have Johnny and poor Johnny? It's always Johnny. Um, can we have Johnny maybe <laughs> have extra responsibilities? You know, whether yeah, it's absolutely. you can't be picking up cones now, but maybe they can round up the balls. Um, can our instructions be shorter, sharper? Can we speak with with Johnny's parents on what they found as best coping strategies and um, use use what they might use in school as well with Johnny. I think sometimes um, our first reaction is to kick a kid out of session or make him s s sit out. But I think maybe the better thing might be to catch them in, catch them being good um, and, and reinforce positive behaviors like, hey, Johnny, I really love the way you paid attention there. Thank you. Um, and start to give little things like that. Would you agree with that, Clarky? Yeah, yeah. But pre because... Um... They, they react. They will re react badly to when you say you can't do that and you can't do this. Positive praise and positive um, a, a way of dealing with them is huge uh, in their lives. And also sometimes um, you can, you know, say right, you can be captain of this team this week, or you can be captain of the team, and give them a bit of extra responsibility, which um, you know also deals yeah. with that kind of issue. But yeah, yeah. yeah I'll say do that's good. Judith, we hope that answered your question. But again, giving them extra responsibility, not just giving them, but making them earn it as well. Um, and then speaking with with the parents on the strategies. Um, you know, asking that child, how can I best coach you? What can I do to help you? You know, what, what can be our sign when you know? Because the, the children know sometimes too. So, you know, I have a, a child that I'm currently coaching right now. Um, that his parents have stopped giving him his meds for his ADHD. So I've asked them, you know, what what do I need to, how can I help him? So we do a lot of small-sided things, a lot where he's active, um, so the focus is staying and it's popping, you know. Any any further questions for Clarky? That was a great question, Judy. I think everybody's shy, Clarky. Yeah, well, maybe I've scared them off. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. I think maybe you were so thorough with your answers and your journey that um, people have been doing the Google and looking for you on the Twitter and all that. So well, yeah. yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on, you can find me on Twitter. Yeah, yeah where, where can they find you on Twitter, Clarky? And uh, tell us about your podcast as well. 
because you do have a podcast and people can subscribe to that right yeah yeah you, yeah you can uh my, my twitter ha handle is uh, it's at soccer coach two two it's uh, when i first set up <laughs> so yeah. at soccer coach two uh, but yeah wow. but the um, you'll find the podcast on soccercoachreview.net, um, which, which you yourself have been on, and, and uh, you know it's well worth listening to that. It's some really good stuff from you, Chris, on that uh, oh, podcast, which is great. Thank you. Uh, so we've got we're doing one uh, called I'm doing a sort of series called Touchline Tales of podcasts, where I'm <laughs> following a uh, following a going through a season with uh, the team and, and getting different coaches to uh, we've done three three uh, three uh, in interviews on that what happens during the season with a with a team and what problems you come across so Brilliant. I, I love that I love that uh, have you thought about getting a player's view from one of those coaches yeah. like a U10 yeah, it, it, it would be in fact um, Nick, you know Nick Levitt, he he yeah. had three questions, three questions he said to ask the kids at your next coaching session. And I've not been uh, what, I, one of what are those was, three questions. Yeah, I, I can't remember the third. One of them was um, what what does the coach do every week that annoys you? Yeah. <laughs> Another one was um, uh, something about um, uh, what would you do differently if you if you were the coach what would you do differently and then i can't remember the third i was going to ask those two but he, he did point out you might not uh you might you might not appreciate the some of the, some of the answers from the kids <laughs> yeah but listen that's the best feedback right feedback is what yeah. kids give us you know yeah um it might be if you were if you were the parent what would you say to your child <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> um we do have another question uh, and it's from AG. He says, uh, any tips for a good warm-up for U10s pre-match? I'll let you have a stab at that one, Clarky, and then I'll throw in. Yeah, well, um, the 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 warm-up, we were, we were talking about the 1-2-3 one, uh, game yeah. that uh, when I tell them was at Barcelona. I, I would often um, use that as a warm-up. But my, my, my main go-to uh, warm-up will be rondos. So if it's uh, a 5 v 2 say, or split them into groups and play, um, you know, three v one, four v two, four v one. So I, I think that, and it also, if if I'm working with them in, in, as a group when they first turn up and they, if it's in a rondo, as they as they're arriving late, if some of them are arriving later, if you're running rondos, they can just jump in and be part of the game. You don't have to stop and restart and say the numbers are wrong. Um, but also, they like, long rondos are great for getting them ready for a match. Really, really good. I, I find that just get some mentally prepared. Yeah, under tens, yeah. Clarky, would you would you do uh, would you do like dynamic stretching and all that, or not really at that that age? Uh, no, I might. Uh, no, I might, I might do a little a couple, couple of little sprints with them, but I, I wouldn't yeah. do. Don't need it, uh, right? And they don't need it uh, physiologically. Uh, so for me, I'd probably do AJ. Uh, maybe a little game of tag knee tag obviously yeah. uh, pre-covid um how many knees can you tag without getting your knee tagged 60 seconds and then i would yeah. do a multiple ball game so two little goals uh if it's if we've got 10 on the roster it's 5v5 one two three balls in at a time going crazy going nuts while the other teams here in america have two nice lines um you know stuff like that um but that just Tag games are great because I will would sometimes uh, do like rugby or basketball. So you have, you know, not allowed little... now though, Clarky. Not <laughs> allowed now. <laughs> Everything social uh, distance. Yeah, Just like I told great. you, you know, Villa's Villa's backline uh, was social distancing before <laughs> <laughs> COVID. Yeah, now. Got, got looking quite good now. They've got a couple of good buys. So. Yeah, but listen, still we're okay. We've not we've not played a game yet. No. So. Oh, I um, asked people, so yeah, it's good. Yeah. So this is again from from Judy. Uh, he says, "Have you found that kids are more physically weak now that 20 years ago, due to iPads, PS4s?" He finds in South Africa. So he's joining us all the way from South Africa. That kids can't even do a rollover, which is scary, right? A forward roll. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we kind of we kind of touched on that earlier. It, 
Yeah, when when kids first come to the set sessions, yeah, they they ha they haven't uh, played out, they haven't been running around, they haven't been out in the playground. So yeah, you you see it towards the end of uh, matches. Um, you know, the last ten minutes in some games, I've looked at players and thought that you know they can barely run. You know, and that's because uh, not 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 purely because they haven't been doing. You know, they they can do it for 10, 10 15 minutes, but then you know it, it suddenly it. Uh, the awful, it, 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 it comes through, doesn't it? You can see that the last few minutes of games and players can't get back and purely down to their physical fitness. Yeah, Judy just put in, I'm a 51 year old woman, been coaching for 22 years in youth development, LOL. Judy, you, you could probably be joining us on this and yeah. answering some of these questions. So hopefully our answers yeah. have, uh, have been helpful. Um, and thanks for joining us from South Africa and wherever you are in the world. But yeah, it's brilliant. This, yeah, Clarky, super. Um, so, Clarky, is there any questions that maybe I should have asked you, but I didn't? And then, if you're up for a crack, Clarky, I'm going to finish with some quick questions, but you're only allowed to give one word answers. Okay, that, I, you, you, your, your questions have been great tonight. So, let's go for the uh, one word answers. Well, Bill, Bill Coates has just jumped in. He says, great course so far. I coach uh, under 12s. I have a heavy roster with 17 players. We are doing a good job with passing, but not so good with positioning. We are aiming for uh, the formation of a 2-3-2-1. Um, so, 5-7-8. So, obviously, with the goalkeeper. Um, it's looking for a diamond shape. Any suggestions on formations for a 9-V-9? What do you suggest? Yeah, well, 9v9 is um, 9v9 is quite a good um, size, isn't it? Because you're you're almost um, you're almost play, if you play it almost like a 442, but you, you take away, so you yeah. would be uh, what is it? Three 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 two. Um, yeah. So you can, three, you can three, play three, that yeah. way, which is a which is a, a really basic one. But I, I do I have found with 9v9 that a diamond midfield where you have a player at the top, a player at the bottom, and two works brilliantly diamond midfields uh make make gives everyone an idea of positions and it also helps them focus um on when when they're you know they get up they they're, they're out of position and he wants them to get back into position then your diamond midfield is a classic way of saying to them right let's get back into the diamond and then the players outside of the diamond know where they're going i really i really like a diamond midfield in, in youth football I, I think works um really well yeah, kind of I would I would say to Bill exactly, you know, I agree with what Clarky says. I would think, Bill, um, start thinking about what do you want him to play at 11 v 11. So, for example, if you want them to play 11 v 11 and the formation you're looking for is a 4 3 3, I would probably focus on the one the goalkeeper, the three in the back. Three in the midfield in a triangle, if that's how you're going to play them, and depends if it's that way or that way. Um, and then, you know, two up top. Um, and then that way, when you do go to 4 3 3, you're just adding a striker and you're adding a defender. But think about the next um, level. The other things to think about would, you know, obviously you put kids in positions, um, but think about positioning and not position. So um, I heard Chris van der Hagen from the Belgian FA say, right? we have to put it in kids' language. So for example, they're playing U12, so they're 11 years old, you might ask them, hey, um, if, a, if a bird's about to fly, what do they need to do? Well, they need to open their wings. Okay, so we need wings. If the bird's head is at the front, yeah, okay, good, that's the striker. Um, and then if we lose the ball, what do we do? Well, we hunt like animals together in a pack to get the ball back. So in the words of uh, Chris van der Hagen, um, but Bill, think about what you want to do with um, how they look, right? How do they look uh, at 11 v 11? And how do we prepare those players for the 11 v 11? And if the constant thing is the triangle in the middle, then focus on that triangle in the middle and then put in the parts. Um, it may cost you some games now, Bill, and you may lose some games. Um, but if, the, if we're looking one, two, three years down the path, I think, you know, that's helpful. And we're okay um, because, you know, as they say in U.S. soccer, there's sometimes we learn more from a loss um, than we do from a win. So, 
Would you agree with that, Clarky? Anything of uh, you disagree absolutely. with there? No, absolutely. And, and yeah, that, that what you said at the end there, you do, you often do learn way more if you, you if you, you, sometimes teams get absolutely battered, you know, nine or ten nil. And I always say to the coach, that's one, well, you know, you probably didn't learn anything about your team today, but those boys learned, learned a lot more about organisation and uh, keeping a good, you know, playing the game than did. But, uh, yeah. This this is uh this is coming from Mr Bean Phil Bean thanks for your question Phil um and the question is is Bill says excellent thank you but back to Phil's question he says how can I get my team to communicate more they are pretty much silent just moving to U13s to 11 aside so my first response is Phil when they're playing how noisy are you <laughs> um because maybe they're quiet because you're noisy, and I could be wrong. Um, but sometimes the quieter we are, the louder they get. But what, what, how, what would you do to get them talking, Clarky? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I do find it's a, it is a problem. Um, com Communication is a huge uh, part of your um, training sessions. When we were at the United Soccer Coaches Convention, um, I. Because of the way the convention's set up, when when you see a coach coaching and he's talking to the crowd, it really silences all the all the players, I think. And so when you're watching the game, they're passing and moving. Sometimes it it doesn't work because they're not talking, um, and that that really highlights that that co the convention setup really highlights some of the problems it is when you you've got a coach who's actually talking to the you're coaching the coaches on the sidelines, but and you can't coach your own team, and they're thinking. I better not shout because you know the coach is he, he might get annoyed because he's trying to tell these people what we're supposed to be doing but we're not actually doing what we're supposed to be doing so the whole thing becomes uh, a real problem and that you know and communication is massively central to that and so you what you you basically when you're in your training sessions you're going to have to get that's when you get them to talk that's when you get them to call names just call names shout you know stop the game and say well if that this is your ball you've got to put your name on it and talk and then if you can see someone not doing things properly, then let's talk about it afterwards, not, you know, and, and, and in the game, then you're, you're saying to them, right, you know, Johnny over there, Johnny, ball, and, and, and you, you know, just do little sessions like that. Or, and yeah. get the ones that don't talk at all, get them to come and stand next to you. And when I'm talk, talking through a game, say to them, well, where should the ball be now? And they can talk to you through the game. And while they're looking at what the action is and telling you uh, what they should be doing, what the other players should be doing, you can say to them, yeah, well, when you're on the pitch, this is what we, this is what you should be telling the players. Uh, yeah. It's different. communication is uh, Yeah, it, it, it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I love what you said. And Phil's piped in, so just to, to set the record straight, he says, we let them play uh, with autonomy and creativity, and, we, and we're as quiet as possible on the sideline. I want them to communicate and make decisions on the pitch during the game. I'm really cautious that my coaching team don't do the talking for them, which I think is brilliant. So I yeah. love what Clark said um, about bringing one of the kids off and making them the commentator. Um, yeah. And you can make them like, uh, you know, whatever, like a World Cup con commentator when a goal is scored, yeah. like in the Spanish league, goal, you know, and have the kids talking. Um, one little exercise I like to do is we play what we call walking soccer. So all the kids are allowed to do is walk. And what happens is, is invariably they start talking a lot more because they're only allowed to walk. Speed walking is okay. So it goes walking, talking, soccer. And you say to them, okay, we're playing six on six. You're only allowed to walk. Speed walking is allowed. And then you ask the kids, you might video them for a little minute, of course, if you've got the disclaimer, uh, disclaimer that you can video. And you say, well, what did you see? What did you notice? What did you guys hear? Oh, we were talking a lot more. Okay, now you, the team that walks and talks the loudest, you're allowed to run. So now they've got the benefit of running. But if you stop talking, you lose the benefit of running, for example. Um, and it's just a little, I don't know why it is, but it always seems to work on um, getting them going and getting them talking and communicating. You know? That's really good, yeah. So Phil says, thank you. Uh, Clarky, we've been on for 70 minutes already. Actually, me yeah. and you have been on for an hour and a half. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time and, and the half a million people you're hitting on a weekly basis. Yeah. I love that. Keep going. Thank you for your role in my journey. Thank you to everybody who joined us. Thanks to everybody who watched this later. Yeah. Um, yeah.
Chris, and thank you for having me on. And thanks for everyone for listening. Yeah, wait, we still got to do the final. We got the one word as Clarky. Yeah. So this is going to get you, right? Real quick. So you get one word answers, Clarky. This is where we see how, how quick you are here. Soccer coaching weekly. Sorry? Soccer coaching weekly. You get a one word answer to that. You don't need Sesh. to be sorry. Was that your answer? <laughs> your answer was sorry. Sessions, yeah, brilliant. Um, Leeds. Brilliant. Bielsa. Uh, a star. Oh, star. <laughs> star. <laughs> Football. Brilliant. Oh, I've said brilliant too many That's times. That's okay, you're good. You're allowed. Chelsea. Can't swear. Boo. <laughs> Boo, good, good answer. Coaching. Fantastic. So, uh, United Soccer Coaches Convention. Interesting. USA. Ah, uh, fantastic place. Mm, love it. England. Good in parts. <laughs> Good in parts. Brilliant. All right, Clarky, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, I'll send no, you the brilliant. recording Thank when you. it's done. Thank Let's you, get Chris. Together again. Yeah, I'd love to. Love to. Everybody, Thank thanks you. for joining us. Take care. Thanks, All the best. Be safe in the world. Remember to wash your hands and social distance. See everybody.